Good evening. Um, I too would like to thank the Students for Justice in Palestine for sponsoring this event and for their tireless organizing on campus um, amidst um, challenges that would constitute a hostile environment. I do a lot of uh, work on campus sexual assault and I will draw some analogies um, around institutional betrayal and the failure to create a safe space for all students um, that extend both to gender violence and to marginalized groups uh, whose uh, insecurity um, has become um, a fact that has been ignored by administrators. Uh, we come to you today as feminist, activists, and engaged intellectuals who share a vision for a just and lasting sol solution of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, but also broadly uh, a vision of a just world where systems of oppression are named and where people affected by the systems find common cause and work in solidarity to resist them and to envision a world in which we we're all can be equal. 35 years ago, I would have challenged every word Dr. Abdel Hadi said. Today, I endorse wholeheartedly every sentence, every word, and share her analysis. In fact, if I were to speak on my own, I would have probably said uh, much of what she said. So I would like to begin by sharing with you how I, an Israeli Jew who grew up in Israel, served in the Israeli military, changed my views and analysis. Because I believe that my story is not a personal story, a human interest story, but rather sheds light on what is possible when you allow yourself to um, learn a narrative that was not part of the propaganda you were fed growing up. According to the late Edward Said, an intellectual's mission is to advance human freedom and knowledge. This mission often involves challenging society and its institutions and actively disturbing the status quo. Said further suggested that an engaged intellectual cannot hide, as Dr. Abdahadi said, behind the pretense of neutrality and objectivity. More recently, Henri Giraud argued that, and I quote, intellectuals must take sides, speak out and engage in the hard work of debunking corporate culture's assault on teaching and learning. They must orient their teaching towards social change, connect the learning to public life, link knowledge to operations of power, and allow issues of human rights and crime ag crimes against humanity in their diverse forms to occupy a space of critical and open discussion in the classroom, and I would say uh, in other public forum um, across campus. But one doesn't become an engaged intellectual overnight. The perspective I'm about to share with you evolved uh, over the past 35 years, uh, maybe over the past 50 some years, and was shaped by both personal and political events. Uh, some of the turning points in my political awakening and feminist understanding of resistance and solidarity uh, were shaped <clears throat> by my growing up um, as a daughter of um, immigrants uh, in a working class neighborhood um, overlooking Nazareth, the only remaining Palestinian town after the 1948 Nakba, um, arriving um, as, as an immigrant uh, to uh, a 
a community that was built on confiscated land, much like the stolen land that we are uh, on today and we take for granted. And I had no idea that this was the case. There were two pages in my history book when I was an honor student uh, that talked about the others whose land we took um, and they were not referred to as Palestinians. They were called Israeli Arabs. So I was exposed to one narrative of the conflict um, that was really as, as um, Israeli historians and soci sociologists that uh, refer to themselves as the new historians and um, a new sociologist have now demonstrated this wasn't a narrative that was based on research. It was, you know, state propaganda that was fed to us to our history books. And by the way, Palestinians who are residents, citizens of the state of Israel were fed the same, uh, the same lies and narrative. So it was not until um, the end of my military service that is mandatory uh, for uh, men and women in Israel. I wasn't aware that there was any way I could resist it. But I also <coughs> sadly have to admit that uh, at that point in my life, at 18, I accepted everything that the state um, kind of put in my head. And I would not have questioned it. In fact, I, I looked forward to serving in um, in the Israeli military. It was towards the end of uh, my military service where I began to recognize the impact of militarization on Israeli soldiers themselves, that I experienced firsthand how militarization and the violence against the other is related to violence against women and the sexism that was part of my everyday experience as an Israeli woman soldier. And mind you, part of Israeli propaganda abroad is that uh, women serve in the military and therefore Israel is a bastion of gender equality. In fact, um, all the debates about women's equality and women and gay participation in the U.S. military always cite Israel as um, an example. And that despite the fact that even as I was going through my military service in the early 80s, women were working to document sexual assault, to document sexual harassment, and we were told that the least that we can do is to understand that when men are fighting, they become needy and they don't always know how to go about their needs. Uh, so th the narrative of uh, national security as a priority um, superseded every other right, uh, including the rights of women. And even though I wholeheartedly endorsed that narrative, I began to see cracks in it. Um, because oppression touched my body, again, it was really um, the beginning of questioning and the basis of my ability to then look at how the discrimination I experienced as a woman, as an immigrant, uh, was similar, although no identi not identical, to the discrimination experienced daily by Palestinians who are citizens um, of the state of Israel. And, and later on, as I became aware of the situation of Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. I will talk about, in passing, um, 
other turning points, like the 1982 Israeli invasion of Lebanon, <laughs> that impacted not only um, the Israeli peace movement, but also the perspectives of Jews um, in the United States especially. And the, the beginning of a, a, a segment of the Jewish community uh, to, to move towards expressing um, initially compassion and, um, you know, since the re recent Israeli attack on Gaza, uh, what I would argue uh, a solidarity stance with Palestinians and, and that uh, Jewish Voice for Peace um, is um, a, a good example of. I mentioned to you that my feminist intersectional analysis that looks at multiple oppressions um, and the search for justice um, looks at um, how gendered violence um, on college campuses, for example, is similar to the violence experienced daily uh, by Palestinians. And how, from looking at that analogy, we can begin to ask critical questions about uh, the ways these examples are dealt with. Dealing with survivors of rape, sexual assault, and domestic violence, we've learned a result of feminist struggles that compassion cannot be conditional. That is, we don't say now, wait a minute, you cannot fully empathize, we cannot fully empathize with a victim, survivor of sexual assault or rape, because we cannot take sides. After all, we have to first hear the perspective of the other side. Your rapist, the person who beat you, etc. He must have had a good reason to do that. Uh, what did you say to provoke him? It's not that these questions were not asked years ago, but today no one, no person of integrity could get away with saying that. Definitely not in public. However, when it comes to um, the question of Palestine, when it comes to organizing um, events like this one, uh, students or faculty are often expected to um, represent the other side. And this was not the case after the movement against apartheid in South Africa gained momentum. People who joined the BDS movement in the, during the struggle against apartheid in South Africa were not intimidated or accused of being against white South Africans as individuals. It was clear that the struggle was to dismantle an unjust system. The same is true for the struggle against slavery in this country. Yes, there were people who benefited from that, but they would not have had public credibility if they said, oh, you know, you can't just talk about abolishing slavery without paying attention to the perspective of the slave owner. After all, they're human beings as well. Why is, then so, why is it then so difficult to accept people who take a strong stance in solidarity with Palestinians and as part of this stance support the campaign for Boca divestment and sanction? Why is such an action labeled anti-Semitism? I want to spend some time on that um, because I grew up uh, with vivid stories of what anti-Semitism is um, because my father was 13 when he witnessed his father's murder in the concentration camp in what is now the Ukraine. So before I talk about uh, Gaza and other turning points, um, I want to take a few moments to address Jewish students in the audience um, or if the no Jewish students um, who, who feel protective of Israel in the audience to share with you 
how I would engage those students. I want to do that because the Israel of my childhood and the dream, the dream of many American Jews, if you want, if you think that it's, it's like an insurance policy that American Jews have, and it's a privilege because most people don't have it. And you know, an American Jew can just get on a plane, arrive in Israel, and become a first class citizen. Um, so it is like you have that um, haven out there, which is really not haven for many people, but at least in people's um, imag imagination, it is. And it's a privilege. And because it's a privilege, it's important for someone like me to, uh, to, to expose that. The recent passing of the Jewish nation state bill by the Israeli government makes clear what Palestinian <coughs> citizens of Israel and human rights uh, activists around the world have known for years, that Israel is a democracy for Jews only. And as Jews of Middle Eastern origin would say, Israel is a democracy for Jews, Ashkenazi Jews only, Jews who kind of appear white and came from Western Europe. And I would say Israel is a democracy for, um, you know, Ashkenazi heterosexual men, uh, you know, so it's a middle class, so, so race and class and, um, and gender and sexual orientation are also part of that. But the main thing is that the passing of that um, nation state bill uh, legalizes apartheid policies. And as a result, we are forced to reevaluate our relationship to Israel. The massive Israeli is military attack on Gaza this past summer that I'll give you some numbers on that. Um, and those are um, low estimates between 2,127 and, and uh, 2,168 Gazans were killed, including uh, close to 600 children, and over 11,000 were wounded. Then on the other side of the conflict, 66 Israeli ch soldiers were killed, five Israeli civilians, including one child, and one Thai civilian, um, and 469 uh, soldiers and 261 civilians were wounded. So you could look at the numbers and get a sense of the asymmetry of that war in quotation mark. It wasn't, it wasn't a war, it was a, a military onslaught. Some of us refer to it as a, a, a genocide. But of course, you know, that uh, poor genocide, um, uh, people, people who, who argue, who defend Israel's, poli Israel's policy, um, reserve the use of that word to, um, to Jews being, um, at the receive, receiving ends. Other numbers, and, and I think the numbers give you a sense of why the international community, including American Jews, um, have been more vocal than during um, prior attacks. Um, as, I mean, this is August, so the situation has gotten worse during the winter with floods. Uh, with Israel cutting electricity to, um, to Gaza. Um, so it's, it's been a, a, um, a humanitarian crisis before the Gaza on onslaught that has intensified um, this past winter. It's been a, a, a very hard winter um, in, in Palestine as well. So approximately 30% of um, the population of Gaza was displaced, um, neglected emergency food assistance, um, about 300,000 people were taking refuge in UN run schools and then were bombed, even though Israel was told that they were in schools. Um, close to 18,000 
homes were totally destroyed and severely damaged. Uh, 37,000 homes suffered damage but were still inhabitable, but that's not the case. Many of them are not inhabitable now with, uh, with the flood. And an estimated of 5,000 to 8,000 civilians fled their homes due to the threat of uh, rocket and mortar attacks. Um, I just came back from New Orleans and um, had the opportunity to, to speak with community activists that um, remembered the devastation after Katrina. This is greater than that magnitude. Uh, and yet, those images and the uh, humanitarian crisis that uh, continues to um, to make life unlivable for um, Palestinians in Gaza is um, is not um, in the headlines anymore. So, with this in mind, and the fact that uh, this massive Israeli attack. Uh, was met with widespread international condemnation. The response on college campuses in the U.S. was that of confusion and distress, especially among uh, young um, Jewish students, including those who present themselves as progressive. Even though an unprecedented number of Jews joined such organizations as Jewish Voice for Peace, J Street, and Open Hillel emerged, uh, and these groups condemned the Gaza attack and Israel's on ongoing occupation, uh, there was also a backlash. And a recent report that was published yesterday argues that there's widespread anti-Semitism on US college campuses, although the lead researchers acknowledged that they did not define anti-Semitism when they asked students if they felt that they were confronting anti-Semitism. As a researcher, I'm puzzled. I'm like, why would anyone even publish a research? How can you? How offensive it is, especially for Jews who have been at the receiving end of anti-Semitism, to claim that there's widespread anti-Semitism and not define the term. So you ask students, do you feel that you are subjected to anti-Semitism? And then 80% said yes, but no one defines what does it mean to be at the receiving end of anti-Semitism. Uh, reports like that are designed to intimidate and silence. But what's most disturbing to me about them is that they make transformation such as the one that I underwent impossible. So I'm more concerned with the implication of these attacks for Jewish students, mainstream Jewish students, rather than for myself, myself and my colleagues, and even students for justice in Palestine, because as difficult as it is to organize an event or get support, we have come to a conclusion about where we stand in relation to injustice. College, the college years represent an incredible opportunity, indeed a privilege, to broaden one's intellectual horizon and to expand our knowledge beyond the confines of what we were exposed to growing up. I worry that the recent attacks on academic freedom, and especially the labeling of organizing around boycott, divestment, and sanction as anti-Semitic, will deprive many students of the opportunity to learn to approach the Israeli-Palestinian conflict from multiple perspectives, including those who make them feel uncomfortable. I say this because it was the discomfort I felt as a student at Haifa University in the early 1980s. It was that discomfort that changed my life, serving as a catalyst for a journey of personal, intellectual, and political transformation. I was not ready for this change earlier. As a junior in high school, I was selected to be part of a youth delegation to England, sponsored by the Jewish Agency. We gave presentations in high schools and stayed with host Jewish families. Halfway through the trip, 
in March 1978, like 30, 30, 40, 35 years ago, Israel launched a massive invasion into southern Lebanon, known as, as Operation Litani, one of many. Pictures, as pictures of dead and displaced Palestinian civilians from the refugee camps in southern Lebanon appeared in the British papers and on the TV screen, we were expected to defend Israel's actions. The Jewish students and community members we met with were critical of Israeli aggression, insisting that you cannot fight violence with greater violence. We were unprepared for their reaction, though some of us were uncomfortable with the images of innocent civilians caught in the fire, we defended Israel's attack as an act of self-defense and prepared a common argument of Israeli propaganda that Jews who enjoy peaceful and prosperous lives in the diaspora have no right to criticize Israel's policy. This argument still persists. A year later, when I graduated from high school, I started my mandatory Israeli service. I served in the Jordan Valley in a role that allowed me to witness up close the militarization of young men. It was only during my military service that I became aware of the existence of refugee camps in the West Bank and Gaza Strip and began to grapple with the toll occupation takes on both the occupied and the occupiers. What I learned left me confused and frustrated. More than anything, I felt alone. At the time, I was not aware of any Israeli Jewish organizations that ex expressed publicly reservations with Israel's invasion of Lebanon and its occupation of the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Everything changed when I, when I enrolled as an undergraduate student at Haifa University in the fall of 1982. I was fortunate to study with brilliant faculty members who exposed me to new ideas and perspectives. Outside the classroom, I began to organize a lot alongside Palestinian students whose commitment to justice and equality was contagious. Many moments of discomfort along the way, oh, although I experienced many moments of discomfort along the way, often when I was confronted with new information about Israeli aggression, in retrospect, I recognized that these were the times that made the most impact on me. Yes. There were moments when I felt guilty or ashamed, but instead of admitting that, I got defensive because expect, accepting the truth went against everything I was taught, not to mention my family and community. I'm going to start wrapping up here. The privilege of studying about the conflict from multiple perspectives allowed me to turn moments of discomfort into learning opportunities. The Palestinian students I met complimented my studies by inviting me to their homes and villages to witness firsthand the discrimination they experienced as citizens of 1948 Israel. My first visit to a refugee camp in the West Bank was a major turning point. The unlivable conditions in the camp made me think of how I imagined the concentration camp my father lived in as a child during the Holocaust. I could not be silent anymore. The risk of speaking up seemed greater than the risk of being called a traitor. Conquered by, uh, okay, I don't know why I'm, okay. My father, a Holocaust survivor who witnessed my grandfather's murder in a concentration camp at the age of 13, could not forgive the international community for its silence and for failing to act. A militant Zionist, my father used the mantra never again to justify Israel's aggression against Palestinians. The exclusive interpretation of never again made no sense to me after visiting a refugee camp. It was clear that the traumatic memory of the Holocaust should inspire in us compassion for other persecuted groups, starting with Palestinians. I'm sharing my story to acknowledge that the discomfort some Jewish students feel on college campuses is real. Although the images and information that one sees around may not reflect the Israel 
in the dream of many uh, members of the Jewish community, these images are not anti-Semitic. In fact, labeling this discomfort anti-Semitic or allowing others to convince us that this is the case can actually undermine our collective struggle against all forms of racism, anti-Semitism included. Turning the discomfort and frustration into attacks on groups like Students for Justice in Palestine or participating in the demonization of scholars and movements critical of Israel will not relieve Jewish students and their supporter of their discomfort. The challenges Jewish students face are an opportunity to learn how to grow personally and intellectually, even if they're not willing to change their political views. Jews have always prided themselves of being people of the book. So we now have an opportunity to turn our discomfort into um, uh, um, into an opportunity to expand our knowledge of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict by paying careful attention to the Palestinian narrative. And one example was shared here by my colleague, uh, Dr. Abdel Hadi. And I end here. I've all, oh, no, uh, 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 let, <laughs> let me give you the, the punchline. I've always been puzzled when asked how many Jews in Israel share my political views? While I understand the question and what's behind it, I think we should pay closer attention to how people change rather than to the numbers. My own life story is but one example. There are countless similar stories of people who have transcended the restricted boundaries of identity labels they no longer wish to identify with. The people I have in mind are not only in Palestine and Israel. They include, among others, anti-apartheid activists in South Africa, men who are involved in challenging sexism, and people who identify as heterosexual who struggle against homophobia. All of these groups are comprised of individuals who pay a personal price for challenging systems of oppression. However, in the face of multiple systems of oppression, that oppress us and others in our names, we cannot remain silent nor neutral. We must take sides, we must choose justice, and we cannot proclaim ourselves to be justice seekers and ignore Palestine. The solidarity movement around boycott, divestment, and sanction is growing. <coughs> Palestine is our South Africa, and we must believe that Israeli apartheid will end. Only then it will be possible to envision a just and lasting peace in Israel and Palestine. <laughs>